Sometimes all a movie needs to get my attention is a silly title. The Twonky? What's a Twonky? I, I gotta know. So, uh, let's talk about the Twonky. Today's episode, The Twonky. <sighs> Hello, Twonkus 3. I am called Matt. This is the second time I'm recording this because my dumb, shitty, stupid, fucking bitch computer decided to just erase the audio the first time. Don't ever buy a Lenovo. They are shit. The Twonky from 1953 stars Hans Conried, the man who played Captain Hook, as well as plenty of other iconic roles. The rest of the cast, um... The rest of the cast, uh... Uh... Wait a minute. I'm not talking about the Twonky from 1953. I'm talking about The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius Season 3 Premiere Attack of the Twonkies, only on Nickelodeon. That's right, a mere four months after the feature-length Win, Lose, and Kaboom, Jimmy Neutron was back with a brand new double-length episode to kick off the third and final season. The second season is really where this show found its footing, so you gotta wonder, can it maintain that all the way to the end? Will we get a satisfying conclusion? Uh, my understanding is the writers knew this could be the final season, but they really wanted a fourth season. So, how will that affect the story? All will be revealed. This is Season 3 of Jimmy Neutron. And to start us off, how do you tell this season from the second season? Jimmy wears a lab coat whenever he's in the lab. I wonder if that's a standards and practices thing. Okay, well more obviously, the clips in the theme song were updated. Which is good in theory, because the original had almost entirely clips from the movie. Seems a little outdated by this point. But I don't know, something's off with this one. It's not bad, but it doesn't capture the same spirit the original did. Maybe using all clips from the movie was a good idea, actually. It gave a sense of cohesion to it. Plus, the movie was pretty introductory. It captures the essence of the series. Series. So it kind of makes for a more appropriate theme song. This tells me Jimmy gets into zany adventures. This tells me there's lore and I need to catch up. One is a little more inviting. I don't know why I'm talking about this. Attack of the Twonkies has a custom opening, just like Jet Fusion. We're not even to the new theme song yet. Anyways, Jimmy Neutron is back and he's name dropping actual 50s B movies. Although, I watched The Twonky, and it's nothing like this episode. It's about an evil TV. It was surprisingly funny, actually. A tad blunt with its TV hypnotizes people message. But it was the 50s, so they were doing it before it was cool. To summarize... I saw that movie. The special effects were third rate. But the acting was better than I expected. I gave it a thumbs up. They do say, a Twonky's a thing you don't know what it is. So I suppose these also count as Twonkies? The movie this episode actually actually is, is Gremlins. And like, Gremlins 2 is the greatest movie ever made. I'm willing to let Jimmy Neutron just do Gremlins. But oh man, it really is just Gremlins. Sheen wants to audition for the Lindbergh Elementary Chorus because it's been specially selected to play the opening of a new library. We'll need plenty of new voices to perform the special song I wrote for the occasion. <laughs> and it goes something like this. Well, I'm a peanut bar, and I'm here to say... Fowl and Willoughby mock children, and Sheen enters the list of characters who have done more bullying than Butch. Carl is looking for a hypoallergenic pet, and Jimmy is going to Twonkus 3 for unspecified scientific material. I don't know, man, does he really need a reason to land on a comet? Anyways, he meets a monster impervious to all his Chekhov's weapons, but they escape the comet safely. At home, a cute creature reveals itself, and Carl begs to keep it as it irritates none of his allergies. But when it gives birth in class, everyone just fucking takes one, despite Jimmy warning them not to. This one is all on them. It is not Jimmy's fault when these people die. And instead of eating after midnight, it's music that transforms them into horrifying beasts. I do kind of like their terrifying designs. 
Although they destroy a ventriloquist dummy, so how bad can they be? Guten Abend, guten Nacht, wirst du wieder gewekt. Nick, why are you doing this in private? Is this supposed to make me think he's less cool? And this episode completely nails what music sounded like in the 2000s. It was this... Or this... Come on, get your feet on. Just walk with your two feet on. Jimmy captures the evil Twonkies, but Greystar, yeah, that name checks out, plays so much music, the Twonkies combine into the monster from the beginning. Sheen, having been rejected from the chorus, sings to his Twonky, but fortunately, he's so bad at it, it instead puts the Twonkies to sleep. Honestly, though, he's not really that much worse than most of the other characters. A is a letter that we all should know. Without it, we can't spell ANT! This prompts Jimmy to strap Sheen to his hover car and have him sing the Mega Twonky to sleep. He gets it strapped to a rocket, but the launch mechanism breaks. I, I can trigger the thruster manually, but I'll need a fire to provide the necessary heat. Does anyone have 4.2 pounds of dry timber wood? Yes, good. Burn him. But we get a cliffhanger. Yes, the Twonkies will return in... Well, like, most of the episodes from here on out. They just become, like, a background gag. They're never a threat again. In fact, we see them listening to music a few times with no issues. It's weird that this is even 45 minutes. It feels shorter somehow. It's a fast-paced episode, which means unfortunately we lose out on a lot of gremlin antics. Although they definitely couldn't go too far. It was Nickelodeon. But yeah, this is a serviceable Gremlins clone. I have certainly seen worse. And as an episode of the show, I think it's pretty fun. I, I think I like this better than Jet Fusion. The show is just better at sci-fi and horror than action. So you do a TV movie and a 45-minute special. How do you follow that up? Well, how about by releasing two of the show's most iconic episodes in the same night? I'm talking about the Inmen. I guess their parents are just okay with them driving around the space car they won from nearly getting the Earth destroyed. Turns out that was a mistake as they drive through a radiation belt, giving them all superpowers. Because Jimmy Neutron really wants you to remember it's from the early 2000s. But in this case, they do enough unique with it that I find it charming rather than dated. And as a result, this is one of the show's most memorable episodes. I still remembered all five superpowers. Cindy is super strong, makes Cindy. Sheen has super speed, Libby delivers the black invisible woman Josh Trank failed to give us, Carl has powerful burps, juvenile, but it's a kid's show, and Jimmy is Orange Hulk. Who are you? And why do you smell all fruity? Nickelodeon, no! Th they had to have known, right? They did that on purpose? I love that they reference a broad range of heroes, even ones who didn't have a movie at the time. Obviously the setup is based on Fantastic Four, but Libby's the only one with Fantastic Four powers. Sheen is the Flash, and I love Carl's Plastic Man inspired costume. They were even ahead of the curve on doing more damage than good. The Inmen have a body count. The powers are draining their life force, but Jimmy's prepared to speed up the process. Cindy gets to tell Jimmy how much she likes him, which finally takes him out of Hulk mode. Sam's heavy seltzer, of course! It absorbs radiation! What? Um... Okay, sure. What can you say? It's remembered for a reason. The costumes are cool, there's funny moments, the powers are honestly really neat. I love that Carl gets the dramatic, I don't want to use my powers story. I don't think it's the show's best, it definitely shows its age in spots, but it's a solid episode. And then that same night they released Lights, Camera, Danger, the one with Quentin Tarantino. The gang want to enter a completely legitimate script writing contest, and they say Jimmy has no creative skills. When they were passing out creativity, you were locked in the little nerd's room. But he makes crazy inventions all the time. Surely that takes some creativity. I have to approach this scientifically. Goddard, download the most successful movies and let me watch them at hyperspeed. Oh, so Jimmy is going to be a studio head when he grows up. 
Unexpectedly, Jimmy wins the contest, and Quentin Smithy, a combination of Quentin Tarantino and Alan Smithy, the fake name the Directors Guild of America used for movies directors wanted their names taken off of, is on the scene. Now that you're a big Hollywood screenwriter, are you gonna remember us little people? And your name is, uh... <laughs> My name is Rob! Oh, I'm just kidding. It's Rob, right? <laughs> Because he's voiced by Rob Paulson. Smithy is voiced by very talented impressionist Jim Meskimen. He even played two of the impersonators on Community. He has a pretty solid Tarantino. My name is Quentin Smithy, and I am here to rock your cinematic world. It's not perfect, but you can tell that's what they're going for. He, of course, hires Jimmy and his friends to be in the movie. Very normal Hollywood practice. Nothing suspicious about that. I'm bigger than Eric Estrada. There he is! They basically make this an excuse to do a bunch of movie parodies, which is fun, and Hugh's off on his Donut Boy B-plot. This is why people remember Hugh. Of course, every time they film a scene, they almost die, and yeah, Quentin Smithy is calamitous. That's how you bring back Calamitous! Fucking egg heist. There's a musical number. Come on, boys, we gotta stop that ghost. And save the day. Halt the alien invasion or we'll be toast. And save the day. I'll put this above the first Christmas song, but below the Pule song. Yes, I'm ranking the musical numbers now. Which is convenient because this episode also has the best musical number of the series. Who's the super cool cop? It always gets the bad guy. Donut boy! That's me, yeah. Hugh saves the day, and they make everyone else's movies with the equipment. Listen, man, any episode of a TV show where the characters make a movie is guaranteed to be one of my favorites of the series, and in Jimmy Neutron's case, it is really funny. I would probably still put Return of the Nanobots above this, but it's a solid second place. And now, random nitpick things that only Matt cares about. IMDB has these episodes in some sort of production order, while Paramount Plus, the DVD release, and Wikipedia have, to this point, had everything in release order. Except Paramount, Wikipedia, and IMDB agree this episode came out on May 23rd, 2005. And yet Paramount Plus, the DVD, and Wikipedia all list it after the next three episodes. Now, maybe that date is wrong, but I've got three agreeing sources, including the company themselves, so I'm gonna trust that this one's actually next. It's just weird that the chronological lists suddenly stop being chronological, and only the non-chronological list has it right? Maybe there's some time travel going on with this time travel episode. Wow, that looks like the future. 15 years into Retroville's future, to be exact. Yep, that's what things look like in the distant future of 2020. Yes, the boys are going to the future, and I gotta take back what I said last time. I remember way more of season three than I thought I did. I've been experimenting on some plants with my new chemical, megalomanium. It makes anything it touches mad with power. Jimmy, why would you invent that? You are literally begging for something bad to happen. It's like he knew this would lead to one of the coolest episodes so far. Although they act surprised at Jimmy for discovering time travel, even though Jimmy has already time traveled on at least three occasions. But I love every part of this episode. Seeing the good future versions of the guys is fun, but the dejected loser future them are really funny. Yeah, Libby got the evil potion as a birthday present because of course Carl mixed up the bottles. And oh my god, the writers of this show wanted to be dominated so bad. It's too much to ignore at this point. Cindy, can you not call me Nertron now that we're married? No! Just screen for four minutes, Jim. I love that they acknowledge the length of the commercial break. And I love Tom Kenny as Robocop. Dance Gazebo. It's required viewing by all subjects of Retroville, along with Dance Airport, Dance Grocery Store, and Dance Dance Hall. Oh yeah, uh, 
dance dance hall. It's uh, my favorite. That was a test. There is no dance dance hall. That's ridiculous. And Butch stands up to the giant four-armed robot from the future? This dude's not a bully. He's out here protecting people. Also, let's address the Sheen and Libby in the room. I think people think this was some will-they-won't-they they thing like Jimmy and Cindy, but I think at this point it's pretty much confirmed they're a couple. They're not dating just yet, but Sheen and Libby at least openly have feelings for each other. It's cute, but I think it might have given kids unrealistic expectations about elementary school relationships. It's me, I'm kids. The next episode's one of the weird ones. Jimmy's moving because his dad's job is going out of business. We're moving? You're moving? Your dad has a job? So he becomes a toy inventor, a job you can definitely apply for. And he makes baby quackers. Well, you're in touch with your inner child, aren't you? Yeah, actually, Peebo and I aren't speaking right now. But I do occasionally talk to Bing Bing, a giant invisible panda. Mom, Dad needs help. I know, honey, but therapy is expensive, and with the move and all... No, Mom! Hugh is schizo and his wife knows it. And the nanobots make a return in this one. I knew they were in a third episode, I just couldn't remember which one or what happened in it. And now that I'm seeing this again, I remember why I don't remember. Because they're barely in it. Of course, Jimmy ends up being the true inventor, giving his dad's already disturbing toys an even more disturbing upgrade. It destroys stuff! Jimmy's inventions are better than Timmy's fairies because Jimmy's allowed to kill people. Maybe we could get a new best friend and train him to be just like Jimmy! Hey, yeah! But where will we find someone so incredibly clueless that he won't even realize what we're doing? La 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 la! Bull be happy! Bull be get a limp brush for birthday! Oh, I love where this is going. Bulby straight up pulls a kebab out of his ass. That's where this is going. So as you can see, baby quackers will appeal to boys, girls, and duck lovers everywhere. <coughs> ah, yes, the three genders. <laughs> Everything about this one is weird. It runs on children's logic of how jobs work, which I guess is fair for a show aimed at kids, but it raises some questions. Like, Jimmy is exposing his inventions to the public. Why have so few people come knocking on his door? Also, their montage track... It's, it's Hey Ya, but it's not Hey Ya. Hugh, mistaking the nanobots for batteries, allows them to control one of Jimmy's deadly toys, which definitely adds to his body count. And in the end, the Neutrons get to stay in Retroville because the thing they created destroyed most of the cars in town, and Hugh gets to keep his job at the auto plant. Because Jimmy lives in Detroit. Ah, wait, it's still the 50s in Retroville. Hugh is probably in a really good union. So, the most negative things I've seen anyone say about Jimmy Neutron online is that it was a weird fever dream show. And when it comes to episodes like this, yeah, I kinda see why. I think these episodes were rare, but they definitely happened. But honestly, I prefer that to some of the less interesting episodes. I get that it's gonna scare off newcomers, but I'm kinda okay with this one being super weird. Trust me, there are way worse weird episodes. Jimmy and Cindy are arguing again because they're too insecure to admit their feelings. And it's getting in the way of Butch teaching a self-defense class? What the hell? He's a nice dude! You guys are just judging him because his name is Butch and he looks like this. Jimmy Neutron takes place in Texas. There it is. Undeniable. And I know you guys are so excited to hear about Jimmy and Cindy on the island. So let's talk about a character I think is very important to the Jimmy Neutron series that I haven't even brought up yet. I am referring, of course, to Paul. Paul is a three-eyed monkey who appears at the end of every episode as part of DNA Animation's logo. DNA Productions was founded in 1987 by Jimmy Neutron creator John A. Davis and showrunner Keith Alcorn, with the name standing for their respective initials. 
They were early adopters of computer animation, doing things like shorts and title sequences for a variety of projects, including Steve Odenkirk's The O Show and The Weird Al Show. In 97, they released a Christmas video titled Santa vs. the Snowman, re-released in 3D following Jimmy Neutron's success. However, their first big break would be a TV movie adaptation of All of the Other Reindeer. Around the end of Jimmy Neutron's run, they released their second feature film, The Ant Bully, which didn't do well. And with Jimmy ending, the company was closed and absorbed into Odenkirk's O Entertainment. Right behind me, you'll see the corporate offices of On the Border and Saffron. Uh, although back in the day, this building also housed the corporate offices of DNA Animation Studios. It's about a half hour from where I grew up, and that's where the magic happened. That's where they made Jimmy Neutron. Okay, okay, Jimmy and Cindy get trapped on a desert island and have to confront their true feelings for each other. It's not subtle, but it's exactly what you want from this episode. It does maybe turn around a little too fast, but whatever, this has been coming since the movie, let them have it. This is a cute episode. Honestly, I think it's one of the show's strongest because it's focused on the characters. The characters were always the best part of this show. Sure, you came for the wacky sci-fi action antics, but this is what kept people hooked. This is the real heart of the show. Next episode, Jimmy is recruited by a college of super geniuses, and apparently the members of Greystar are smarter than I would have guessed. And Jimmy makes an enemy of the Crypt Keeper, John Kassir, who seeks to embarrass Jimmy while stealing his designs. How dare that punk steal my scientific thunder! I've gotta find a way to slap him down fast. And speaking of stealing designs, Seymour is basically the same model as the kid losing his ice cream in the theme song. I'll be honest, this one's maybe trying a little too hard. I like it in concept, but something about the execution is off. Although they've hit a point where no matter the episode, Sheen is still funny. Next up, the reckless poorly thought out flip joke! This one's kind of in the middle. Some good stuff, some bad stuff. Toga, 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 toga. Up next is the one where Carl gets ass pregnant. <sighs> Do I really have to talk about this one? It's the one where Carl gets ass pregnant. They do an Aliens parody, and Carl gets pregnant in his ass. This one made waves a year or two ago, so if you've seen a video about Jimmy Neutron recently, it was probably about this episode. Is what I wrote in the script before Jordan Fringe uploaded a full series analysis? You stepping in on my territory, bruh? So, uh, to avoid talking about this episode, I'm gonna divert my attention with the worst thing I can think of. Uh, Carl, scrape me a sample. Me? Don't worry, I'll be monitoring from a safe distance the whole time. You thought I wasn't prepared to do it, didn't you? <laughs> Bitch. Jimmy Neutron is Rick and Morty for kids. There I said it. I don't mean that in a positive or a negative way, it's just an observation. Obviously I like both shows, although I'm willing to acknowledge both have their faults. Rick and Morty for kids doesn't necessarily make you good. Part of what makes Rick and Morty brilliant is that it's very adult. Rick and Morty for kids sounds kinda terrible. But at their core, I think they're both shows about irresponsible geniuses. Jimmy Neutron, being a kid's show, is pretty deliberate about making sure he has his comeuppance, where Rick and Morty kinda rides off the fact that Rick so often gets away with it. But on top of that, both shows have characters openly acknowledge how much they love getting involved in danger adventures. I am not saying Jimmy Neutron is as good as Rick and Morty, in fact part of my point is that it's not. I just mean I enjoy them for similar reasons. And occasionally both do episodes on cosmic pregnancies that you just want to pretend don't exist. Uh, this is one of those places where Jimmy Neutron's weirdness starts to become a bad thing. Which is too bad, because this is the episode that reveals Butch isn't a bully. He's actually a pretty decent dude. My counselor was right. All I needed to curb my anger was a hobby. Hell, one of his first appearances was playing catch with his little brother. Leave Butch alone. Moving on, we get to see the Neutron family, who apparently John A. Davis married into. Hugh's whole family has issues, and we get an update on Grandma Neutron. 
It's too bad your dear old granny couldn't be here to see this. But she's in Reno, kicking butt at the slots! I can see her <laughs> Go <old> granny! <laughs> While most of the family looks like Hugh, I guess baby Eddie takes after Grandma Neutron because they basically look identical as babies. So one of Jimmy's relatives is secretly an evil genius. Can you guess who it is? Of course it's the baby. This one's fun just for seeing Hugh's extended family. Mark DiCarlo does a great job voicing most of Hugh's family, especially baby Eddie. Wait till I hit puberty! Ba-bang! The baby Eddie twist is obvious and it's kinda lame for them to just go, oh Goddard had a backup battery. But it's cool to have Jimmy up against another genius. It's certainly better than its company. Really, just make this a 22 minute segment and ditch the other one. Next is an interesting sequel episode, My Big Fat Spy Wedding, the return of Jet Fusion, still voiced by Christian Slater. They got Christian Slater on twice, and Michael Clark Duncan, and Wendy Malick because Jet is marrying Beautiful Gorgeous. Everyone acts like this is weird, but that makes perfect sense. She straight up said in the last one she didn't want to be evil, and Bond totally goes for some evil girls. But this is a very typical Jimmy doubts an old villain, misunderstandings ensue making them seem good, but they're not. It's getting old, guys. And beautiful gorgeous getting hypnotized in the first Jet Fusion felt a little fetishy, but this one goes overboard with it. This is uncomfortably kinky, and I just watched the episode where Carl gets ass pregnant. So Neutron's the best man? Yeah, more like best nerd. I bet he'll look like a... Hunk muffin. Girl, he's just in a tuxedo. You got it bad. Yeah, they lay it on a little too thick for an episode where Jimmy and Cindy don't even end up together. Pretty random selection of characters at the wedding. Do any of these people know Jet or Beautiful? And did Calamitous just send the empty Quentin Smithy suit? Because that man is not a real person. This episode so desperately wants to be something, but it's not. It's not an interesting expansion of the canon, it's just another episode. The best it can achieve is being amusingly weird by the end. I'm ranking this song right below Donut Boy though, I dig the gospel vibes. And so there are now 10 episodes left in this video. It is October of 2005. The show will air its final episode in November of 2006. And we're doing a Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon parody because, oh yeah, it was 2005. Weirdly, this one's a Jet Fusion follow-up too, this time referencing the Guild of Monks Sheen became the chosen one for because he can put his foot behind his head. It's almost like they pitched a 44-minute Jet Fusion 2 and when Nick said no, they just split it into two episodes. Like in this one, Cindy wants to ask Jimmy to a dance, which would be a good setup for her drooling over him later. Adding ninjas would make this kinda underwhelming wedding plot more Jet Fusion-y. And this episode ends with Sheen and Libby officially dating, which gives it a big tie to the canon. They even have a blooper reel that feels like it would have been at the end of a hypothetical second Jet Fusion special that included this plotline. That's all speculation, though. Bowlby has a sister. Slap, 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 clap, 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 slap, 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 clap, clap, clap. I've downloaded the basics of Kung Fu off the internet and onto a disc compatible with the Dance Teacher 8000. Now I'll just download them into you. Okay, just give me a second. I know Kung Fu. Guys, let me handle this. Hey, Jackie Chan. Oh, fuck, uh, I don't think that one's gonna fly anymore. Anyways, I think this is the stronger of the two Jet Fusion follow-ups, mostly on the grounds that it's really funny. Honestly, removing jet lag might have helped this episode. That could really have killed the pace on this. And they were maybe overdoing it with the return episodes, because this next one's the return of the Space Bandits! Jimmy's sick of being called short, even though with his abnormally large head, he seems just as tall as everyone else. And I guess Jimmy has advanced from sneaking out to go to Retroland to ditching school to go to Retroland. Unless this was an extracurricular basketball game, which in that case 
Why are these guys even here? He tries to shrink a guy, but instead shrinks the entire town. I'm the same size as my Ultra Lady action figure. I could date her. You can't date her, she and she's Ultra Lord's fiance. And as of last episode, you're dating Libby. Y'all, she might be a bad boyfriend. Of course, the Space Bandits return at just the wrong moment and begin collecting the citizens of Retroville to sell his toys. Carl, what have they done to you? The Space Bandits actually really shine here. I think A Beautiful Mind was a better episode, but this is the better Space Bandits appearance. They are really funny. Can't you see that this senseless fighting is tearing us apart? You're right. I hate it when we argue. Mmm, got a deep love for you fellas. Brother love. So, uh... You guys want to see another hypnosis episode? No, stop! Bulbin not recyclable! Oh, Butch, this isn't you. After you! Oh no, after you! Let's go at same time! Splendid! That's better. This episode is creepy, especially if you're one of those people who never liked the CG in this show. The elusive Betty Quinlan returns, beckoning Jimmy to watch the Happy Show Show, which is apparently hypnotizing people into being happy and nice. Luckily, Cindy was out of town and hasn't seen the Hypno Show. So, uh, why were you at Betty Quinlan's house? No, please, address this. This episode has better kung fu than Jet Fusion. I'm pretty sure what Cindy does is impossible. And Jimmy undoes the hypnosis by hypnotizing everyone to not be hypnotized? I'm not happy about this one bit. Really? I kind of like it. You would, cage boy. I'm pretty sure the message is it's bad to expect people to be happy all the time, which is a good message, but something's a little off with the delivery. I know you meant well, Grandma Taters, but you should really leave mass mind control to the trained professionals. I appreciate how creepy they went, but otherwise there's nothing here. It's not very funny, and Grandma Taters isn't much of a threat. They even let her go at the end. So, um, what were you doing at Betty Quinlan's house again? I told you nothing! So why were you going there? Why are you cross-examining me? Oh, so you admit you had a reason! Girl, you are way too clingy for someone who is not ready to commit. And it's a double feature of Betty Quinlan, her last hurrah. So, I already admitted I was kind of okay with her first two appearances. Really, my distaste for the character comes down to just these two segments. Ooh, did this one get under my skin. Jimmy gets into magic to impress Betty, and Cindy actually deliberately sabotages his experiment. Jimmy's just a little too Betty-obsessed in this one. He comes off kinda creepy. Watch your precious head. And Cindy is not having it. She's not fun and catty in this one. She's legitimately angry, and I think rightfully so. Sheen is funny as always, and the visuals in this one are cool, including the Twilight Zone and Twin Peaks references. Shame it's bogged down by this pointless drama. They meet a magician who's pretty funny, but then they escape pretty easily. And it's like I said, there's no satisfying conclusion. Betty straight up says she's not interested in Jimmy and then just bounces. It almost makes it seem like she's only been as flirty with Jimmy as she has to annoy Cindy. But she doesn't just say that, because that might actually be a funny conclusion conclusion to this character. She just says, he's yours, and that's it. But hey, I guess Jimmy did make Betty Quinlan disappear. It does feel weird to bitch this much about a character with a major speaking role in four episodes, two of which are different segments of the same 30 minute block. She's not even my least favorite character, Brittany is. This is just awful character design. I guarantee someone took one look at this, changed the channel, and never watched Jimmy Neutron again. Next, Jimmy's trying to beat Da Vinci's invention record, so he recruits his evil clone to fill in for him. Evil Jimmy tricks him by draining the de-evil fluid and steals the hypno beam. Guys, come on. Although really, if you have a hypno beam, why even bother with this de-evil fluid? What even is in that? That doesn't last too long as Evil Jimmy creates a second evil Earth that threatens to destroy original Earth. 
I kind of love the evil Earth. I'm super disappointed there were no interactions between evil Jimmy and evil Cindy. That's like the power couple of the century. Jimmy reverses the process and evil Earth is sucked into a dark matter dimension or something. I, I, I'm not sure I actually get it. But evil Jimmy does promise revenge. Honestly, I wish this one had used its time better. Less of the hypno antics, more time in evil Retroville. Next, Jimmy and his pals investigate the Bahama Quadrangle, and it feels like they're maybe leaning a little too supernatural here at the end. Like, Jimmy has always been sci-fi with a tinge of horror, but this is starting to be a lot of horror. I guess they give it a science-y explanation, but they're still doing a Bermuda Triangle episode. I do love Dr. Moist, the crazy scientist they find at the center of the quadrangle turning people into algae men. I knew a young lady named Eloise Cracker, whose beauty could knock a man right off his rocker. Now don't get me wrong, I don't want to knock her, but she stank like the sweat sucks in Davy Jones' locker. Demolition Man reference. They get the antidote and escape, but decide they're not going to keep exploring this place. Then Carl has told his pen pal girlfriend that he's basically Jimmy. Jimmy calls him out on this, and Carl ignores him. See, they know they're doing a trope, and they're leaning into it. Wouldn't it be funny if Carl pretended to be Jimmy? It would at least give us a meme-worthy Carl costume. I'm Sheen! He really used to be a monkey? Monkey? What kind? Flying monkey? Squirrel monkey? A chunky funky monkey? And God, Carl's a dick in this one. Svetlana, you could do better. You nincompoop! You must have put the wrong fuel in my hover car! Then again, Jimmy's also kind of rude. Of course, in the end, the truth is revealed and they bond over their shared love of llamas. You know what? It's not one of the greatest, but it's a memorable episode at least. Although I kind of hate this sort of non-joke they end on. It's like the Swedish poet once said, Herda, gerda, gerda, schmerda, gerda, herda. Just stop it. Okay? Ah, yes. Carl Weezer, Jimmy's closest friend and the main character I have the least to say about. Carl, I think, is the least essential character. Not that he isn't important, he's just the one you could change the most without affecting the story. Honestly, I think he works better as a foil to Sheen. The two bounce off each other really well, with Jimmy largely playing the role of the straight man. I find his humor a tad more repetitive than Sheen's. Like, they do this gag of him getting two things mixed up and giving Jimmy the wrong one in, like, four episodes. But he's still a really funny character. I don't want to make it seem like I don't love Carl. I just think of the five main kids, he's my least favorite. But hey, they're all solid characters. In the next episode, Jimmy gets framed for a robbery, and he, Sheen, and Carl end up on a chain gang. Usually when I'm going through these, I stop and write things down while I watch, but this one I just sat there dumbfounded the whole time. This one's way goofier than most episodes. Like, Jimmy will do Looney Tunes stuff sometimes, but this episode goes way overboard with the wackiness. Weirdly, this feels more like an episode of Back at the Barnyard? Like, someone has framed Jimmy and it's this Buford T. Justice parody who's in this episode and only this episode, and whose motives for framing Jimmy specifically are never elaborated on. Now, true, local law enforcement have every reason to be upset at Jimmy, but if you wanted to arrest him, I think you could make a pretty solid case without the frame-up. Then there's this not-quite-Benny-Hill-theme chase that goes off the rails. It kind of stands out in its weirdness, I think. I have to wonder what the cultural memory of this episode would be if it had come out, say, mid-season two, not right as the show was ending. Then again, I certainly managed to remember the B segment. It's Flippy. Now long, long time viewers will remember I actually talked about Flippy before in my childhood trauma video. Uh, that video means a lot to me. It was my first big viewership bump, and it's how I met my friend Michael, and by extension, many of my closest friends, and even my current relationship. Uh, now, that video would exist without Jimmy Neutron, but still, it's in there, so I just think it's neat the little ripples this show has had throughout my life. I don't recommend that video, though. Most of my old videos are terrible. 
Anyways, for those just joining us, I find ventriloquist dummies unsettling. And here they got a creepy living ventriloquist dummy. Yeah, I said in my childhood trauma video this should have been a Halloween episode, but in retrospect, no, at this point the show was pretty heavy on the horror. Hugh gets a new flippy, which he's determined to show off at Jimmy's school. Hello, Neutron resident. See, si, this is Pancho's hat repair. Your sombrero, she is ready. Okay, that one's definitely racist. So Jimmy plants a chip in Flippy to make his dad funnier. Sheen's dad is an air conditioner repairman. And Jimmy's dad isn't really that much funnier with the chip. I don't remember what random ass comparison I made in my other video, but his jokes feel overdone regardless. Just sometimes they're soft dad jokes and sometimes they're insult humor. Well, I got arrested for stealing a sheriff's badge. Really? Why'd they let you go? They couldn't pin it on me. I haven't seen this many teeth since Miss Fowl came back from a sale at the Danger Depot. <laughs> Of course, Flippy is slowly stealing Hugh's brain, and once he's got all of it, he goes to dispose of the body. But it is Hugh's brain, so he gets distracted by ducks. And after Flippy threatens to set the inside of his head on frappe, Jimmy's very lucky blasting this chip didn't kill his dad, and it ends very creepily. Yeah, I'm not super into this episode. It's not funny, I don't find Flippy particularly interesting as a villain, and it freaked me out as a kid. So, these next three episodes are interesting to me because Nick just sort of dropped them without any fanfare in late 2006. Just a couple episodes of a show they'd cancelled months ago, they just wanted to get out there. Uh, I caught one of these episodes in reruns once, and I was really upset that there was Jimmy Neutron I hadn't seen before. Well, it turns out there's two episodes that, as of writing this, I still don't think I've ever seen. So, join me in watching How to Sink a Sub. Holy shit, this episode is good. It's got everything I want. From the small things like the return of Jim Coach Belushi and Sheen's dad, to the big stuff like Jimmy and his peers' overt disrespect of authority. There's even a particularly gross joke that doesn't overstay its welcome. It's kind of effective at something this show has a tendency to go overboard on. Jimmy gets his teachers trapped in hyperspace for a week, leaving the Lindbergh Elementary School students with no supervision, in a scene that feels reminiscent of the movie. But of course, Jimmy's parents catch him in his bullshit and fill in as substitute teachers, much to the kid's embarrassment. So Jimmy develops a concentrated version of the teen rebellion hormone that ends up in the parents' coffee. I was really worried they were gonna skimp on the parents' rebellion, especially in an 11 minute episode, but no, you get just the right amount before the teachers return and start beating up the parents. Good thing I stocked up on teaching aids at the conference, like these eraser nunchucks! Yeah, that seems about right for the Texas educational system. This was a good episode, why was this one dumped? You couldn't have done this instead of Carl getting ass pregnant? In the next segment, Jimmy is prepared to be the next Max Headroom. That's not how chroma key works. I keep neglecting to mention Corky Shimatsu, the big time producer who shows up in a bunch of episodes, mostly because he's almost entirely unnoteworthy every time. Including this time! The kids get their own news show, with Jimmy and Cindy hosting Carl on weather, Sheen on sports, and Libby with a gossip segment. Well, it seems a certain big-headed genius has been playing footsie in the library with a blonde colleague. Looks like this love-hate relationship is turning into all love all the time. They buried the episode that basically confirms Jimmy and Cindy are a thing? You monsters! Yeah, this is kind of a Libby-focused episode, with her gossip segment ruining her friends' lives and her becoming power-crazy. Yeah, they buried one of the few episodes centered on Libby. And look, I don't think they hand-picked this episode to be buried. Hell, I have pretty good evidence the people in charge didn't even watch this show. But, uh, I don't respect Viacom as a company, so I am prepared to give them the worst faith interpretation of this turn of events. They did this because they were racist. Ain't no way this fouls a man! I gotta go, Principal Willoughby. I'm sorry, what? 
To stop her segment, they try to convince her Carl has an alien brain worm, which is kind of a sitcom cliche, but on the other hand, Libby lives in a universe where aliens, and especially evil aliens, are confirmed to exist, so it kind of makes sense for her and the town to believe. And it feels like they didn't know how to end this one. Obviously, Libby learns her lesson, but then every character has to do a bit before the episode ends. This is a problem I have with a lot of Fairly Odd Parents episodes, but Jimmy is definitely guilty of it a few times, too. Yeah, this one's decent. It's not awful or anything. I got some laughs. But despite the confirmation we've all been waiting for, this one feels inessential. Let's see what else I've been missing. Jimmy and Cindy get flirty while stargazing, with Cindy being really insistent Jimmy look at Mars. But not without good reason, as there's a massive energy source on the planet. Why don't those two just get a lab? I wish I had a camera on my face when she said that. I fucking lost it. Eustace Scramp is out just stepping on people with his giant robot, as rich kids do, but decides not to step on Jimmy because he swore everlasting vengeance upon him. Jimmy and Cindy are back to will they, won't they, but come on, we know they will. Anyways, the evil tech-obsessed rich kid wants to be the king of Mars. Shoot! Shoot! Out of here! Jimmy's attraction to Cindy continues distracting him, prompting him to push her away. Blinded by jealousy, Cindy storms off to join Eustace, even though he's definitely going to betray her. Oh look, he betrayed her! Jimmy almost kinda admits to liking Cindy, and I'm sorry, they're a cute couple, but you can only have them kinda admit they like each other so many times. Carl, pants off now! They make it to the power source, and it turns out there's ancient, brilliant Martians who built and use the power source. They're prepared to destroy the Earth because it's kinda annoying to them, so Jimmy and Eustace have to break their machine. This one's fine, not great, not awful. Eustace felt a tad underutilized in his return appearance, but I don't really care for him anyways. And then we get an episode about Sheen's dad? I must not have been the only one who wanted more of him because he is in more of this season than the rest of the franchise combined. Sheen's dad is an odd character. He appears in the film, but whenever Sheen mentions living with a family member, it's usually his grandma. Betty, is he Ultra Lord franchise film number 24? It's the same as Ultra Lord franchise film number 23, but with eight minutes of new footage! Holy shit, Jimmy Neutron predicted the MCU. Sheen's dad begs Jimmy to make him a superhero so he can make his son love him more than Ultra Lord. That's a fucking plot. No seriously, Jimmy Neutron predicted the MCU. What the hell? Unlike Tony Stark, however, the suit Jimmy has built runs out of battery really, really quickly. And that is an alarmingly realistic alligator. It kind of clashes with the show's art style. Of course, Sheen's dad saves them with the power of air conditioning repair. A tad predictable, but it's kind of cute. This is Bowlby's final episode. He's canonically dead. Then Jimmy enters Goddard in a dog show that he gets disqualified from. Yeah, obviously that was going to happen. Come on, Jimmy. Goddard feels bad about not being a real dog and runs off. Yeah, a Goddard-centric episode. You didn't really get those. The town goes really hard on Goddard, but in the end, he saves Cindy and is awarded for his efforts. And man, Mayor Gable was in way more episodes than I thought. How did I forget this character? These later episodes all have a particular tone to them that this one somehow lacks? This feels like it should have come out mid-season two, but... I like season two, so props on pulling one out right at the end. Not a great episode, but it does what it needs to. All right, we're back to the uh, the tier chart here. And first off, I, I think I want to move Professor Calamitous, I presume, down to A tier. That was ambitious of me. It's a good episode, but it's, it's an A tier episode. It's not S tier. It is an A tier episode, decidedly. After that, you got Monster Hunt. Uh, it's funny. There are jokes I enjoy about it. Captain Betty is fun, but uh, that's it's a B tier episode. I don't I don't love it or anything. Jimmy for president. I'm on the fence about because it's it's it introduces Bulby for one thing. It introduces Bulby Stroganovsky. Uh, it's uh, also like it's it's a fun episode. It gets a little weird. It gets a little strange. I. I'm putting it in A tier. I'm putting it in A tier just because it introduces Bulby. Um, I think without Bulby, it might be B tier. Return of the Nanobots S tier. It's best episode of the show. 
Holly Jolly Jimmy, uh, B tier. It's a it's a mixed bag as far as like a holiday episode goes, but it's still like mostly positive. Uh, Love Potion 976-J, I feel like is so much more essential to the series. I think I'm going A tier with that one. It is it's it's a fun episode, and it, it introduces a lot to the series. And we got Sheen's Brain. Ah jeez, Sheen's Brain. I hmm. Mmm. I'm on the fence with this one too. I I need like a, a tier between A and B to 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 put these. I guess I guess I'm gonna put Sheen's brain in B tier just cause like he is kinda creepy, he is kinda uncanny. And I like I'm fine with that, but like I, I get that it's gonna be a turn off to some people. Maternatron knows best C tier. It's fine. It's just there. Send in the clones? Funny episode, not 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 perfect S tier, but absolutely an A tier episode. L very funny. They didn't know how to end it, but it's it's a very funny one. Great Egg Heist F tier. Fuck that episode. This is this is one of the worst episodes of the show. The feud, honestly, uh, uh, it's is it C tier or is it D tier? I'm, I'm, the, there's not there's not that much in D tier. I'm gonna put it in D tier just because like I'm not I'm not that into it. Out Darn Spotlight, I wanna give it shit for, like, being a, a strong Betty Quinlan episode, but at the same time, they showed us, like, all of Macbeth in space, so that's that's at least worthy of an A tier, just for Macbeth in space. The Junk Man Cometh, um, that's a fun episode, introduces the Junk Man, uh, we'll go, we'll go A tier, why not? Give it an A, why not? Foul Bull, also an A. Very good episode. Good episode. The Science Fair Affair. I don't know, it just kinda... It's just kinda there. I didn't I didn't think too highly or too lowly of it. Minute Work S tier. Classic. Classic episode. Right, this is this is the episode of Jimmy Neutron people remember. Uh, Billion Dollar Boy. Introduces Eustace Stritch. Still a C tier episode. Not... Not super into that one. The Mighty Weezers. There's some fun in the Mighty Weezers. I enjoy the Mighty Weezers. Not 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 great or anything, but it's a that's a B tier for sure. It's a B tier. Win, lose, and kaboom. Hmm. I think that's also. Hmm. Hmm. I think it's B tier. I think it's B tier. That's just that's just me being completely honest with that one. Attack of the Twonkies can go to A tier. I liked Attack of the Twonkies. That's a good one. The Inman. Oh, jeez. Oh, that is a classic. Um, hmm. Is that A tier or is that S tier? That could be S tier. What do you guys think? Is Inman S tier? I'm giving Inman S tier. Why not? I'm absolutely giving Lights, Camera, Danger S tier. That's like my second favorite episode. That's like right below Return of the Nanobots. The Tomorrow Boy is really good episode. Really strong episode. That one's going to A tier. Fundamonium? Weird, weird episode. Putting it in C, just because I, I really don't know what else to do with it. It's just so odd. Stranded, S tier. You know that's S tier, baby. You know Stranded is S tier. Jimmy Goes to College, uh, it's another C tier. I, I didn't... It's nothing. It's it's just sort of there. Who's Your Mommy? F tier. Not do... We're just not going to talk about it anymore. That's That's all we're saying about it. Clash the Cousins, uh, and it's it, it's kind of fun seeing like Jimmy's relatives, Hugh's relatives, seeing Hugh's relatives is a lot of fun. And we'll we'll go B tier on that one. My big fat spy wedding. It's just it just feels so underwhelming as a a Jet Fusion follow up. That one's going C tier. Crouching Jimmy, Hidden Sheen. That's that might even be A tier. May mm, is it A tier? Is it B tier? Mmm, I'd fuck it. We'll go A tier. Crouching Tiger, Hidden Jimmy, going in the A tier. Why not? The Incredible Shrinking Town. Fun, fun episode. That's an A tier. One of Us. I guess C tier. I guess that's a C tier episode. Vanishing Act. Oh boy, what do I want to do with Vanishing Act? Honestly, like this may come as a shock. I think I'm putting Vanishing Act in D tier, 
Because there are some cool visuals. There is some cool stuff going on with that episode. I just don't like how Betty Quinlan-centric it is. Uh, the Trouble with Clones. We'll put it in the B tier. It's a good... It's a solid episode. But I again, like I said, I wish there was more clone stuff in it. I, I wish the, this evil Earth was more focused on. The Evil Beneath is such a weird episode. Because, like... It's got this really kooky villain, but also, like, I completely forgot it existed until I was watching it again. I'm like, oh yeah, that was an episode. I guess, I guess I'll put it in meat tier. It's fun. Carl Weezer, boy genius. Eh, C tier. It's like, like the cool Carl meme, that's fun, but, like, there's not much else going on in that episode. Honestly, he and Jimmy are being, like, a dick in that episode, so, yeah, C tier. Who framed Jimmy Neutron? I... It's just so tonally out of whack. There's something off with this episode. And, like, there's a part of me that wants to be like, you know, I, I sort of appreciate how weird it got and put it in the C tier, but I think just for, for how off it is, I have to put it in D tier. It just does not feel like a... like a normal episode of Jimmy Neutron. Flippy... Look, maybe I'm biased. Maybe I'm a little bit biased with this one. I'm putting Flippy in F. There's nothing I like about that episode. There is nothing I like about that episode. And it freaked me out as a kid. So, that's like sort of a double whammy. Flippy's going in the F tier. How to Sink a Sub. Actually a very fun episode. I really enjoyed this one. That's going up to A tier. Uh, all the parents misbehaving. That's fun. Lady Sing the News. Uh, B tier. B tier. That's a solid B tier, I think. King of Mars, uh, it's going right with Billion Dollar Boy in the C tier. That's Eustace Stritch is a C tier villain. El Magnifico. Uh, hmm. I, I kind of like, it's cute. You get to see more of Sheen's dad. It's fun. El Magnifico B tier. And you know what? Best in show, you can also go in B tier. That's, that's a fun little Goddard-centric episode. You can see, you can see my bias. I've put most of the episodes in the A tier and the B tier. Uh, D tier and F tier definitely have a lot fewer than the other tiers going on. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's my Jimmy Neutron tier chart right there. Um, I guess that only leaves us with one episode. The League of Villains, the series finale. Will it be an epic conclusion, or a last-minute fumble? Only one way to find out. King Goobot returns to unite all Jimmy's greatest nemeses, and a few filler villains. Look, King Goobot, the Calamitous Family, the Space Bandits, all obvious picks. The Junk Man? Okay, I guess. Eustace Script? That's just some snotty rich kid. He's not a great villain. And Grandma Taters and Baby Eddie feel picked out of a hat. They were one-off villains. Why them and not, like, Dr. Moist or Seymour? It would make just as much sense. Where's Evil Jimmy? He seems like such an obvious pick that I actually convinced myself he was in this. I have created false memories of Evil Jimmy appearing in this episode because he's such an obvious pick. Definitely more memorable than Baby Eddie and Grandma Taters. But hey, it's not just the villains they brought back, as Jimmy has envelopes containing the love potion and their Inmin powers. The villains split up into teams. Team Inventions, Team Sexy, Team Why Are You Here, and Team The Space Bandits. Team Why Are You Here disable Goddard, because I guess taters can do that. Team Inventions gets the kids unable to stop dancing, and Team The Space Bandits seal Jimmy's lab. After which, Jimmy is kidnapped with Sheen sneaking aboard to save him, and immediately getting caught. But in jail, he bonds with T, who the other villains don't respect. Meanwhile, Carl, Cindy, and Libby have to break in, grab the Inman packets, and blast off in Jimmy's rocket to save Jimmy and Sheen. Unfortunately, T has broken them out, so they're actually headed away when the others get there. Also, the villains shoot them down onto Mars, which, you know, could have been a problem regardless. And Jimmy's parents send everyone in town back in time 500 million years. 
and they couldn't miss one final opportunity to have Carl mix something up, giving everyone the wrong Inman packets to hilarious results, and giving Jimmy the love potion as he dropped the packet for Hulk Jimmy. Jimmy, of course, uses the love potion to make Beautiful Gorgeous and the Junk Man fall in love. Beautiful Gorgeous and overriding people's consent. Name a more iconic duo. They even work in a Brobot cameo. There's the moon! We can hide there! Good idea! Fine, Jimmy! I trust you! Wanna play a game? I can make moon castles! Whether you're a side it's called I Love Jimmy! 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 I'd rather take my chances with the villains. Jimmy discovers the wormhole everyone has fallen through and goes back to prehistoric times. And Libby calls Carl a brother. Come on, Invisible Brother! You get his attention and I'll burp him down! Mmm, no comment. Come on, in, people! Oof. Uh, even less comment. And this seems pretty dangerous. Like, this could kill someone. So my question is, how many people have Jimmy and his friends killed? I'm keeping three counts. A definite body count, deadly scenarios, and potentially deadly scenarios. Body count is characters actually dead. Deadly scenarios are times someone definitely died, but we can't say how many, and potentially deadly scenarios are one where someone could have died, but it wasn't shown on screen. This does not include the many, many times they almost kill someone, but didn't. In the movie, Jimmy knocks a man off a billboard. In Jimmy on Ice, Jimmy causes an ice age, which could definitely kill someone. In Substitute Creature, Jimmy turns Miss Fowl into a giant monster, potentially killing this guy. In Operation Jet Fusion, Sheen causes an avalanche where people live. In Nightmare in Retroville, Jimmy creates vampires and werewolves which don't seem to kill anyone, but definitely potentially deadly. I'm considering Sheen's Reign of Terror and Sheen's brain potentially deadly. He's definitely prepared to kill Carl and Jimmy. In Send In the Clones, Jimmy kills five of his clones, who I'm considering to be individual human beings. In Men at Work, McSpankies destroys three buildings which I refuse to believe didn't kill someone. In Attack of the Twonkies, Jimmy tells everyone not to take home the Twonkies, so for once, their blood is not on his hands. In The In Men, Sheen gets a car with a driver caught in a tornado. Carl destroys an 18-wheeler and causes a pileup with an unknown number of fatalities. Jimmy also destroys two tanks with drivers inside. I do question how much that counts. He's not in control, and it's not like he deliberately gave himself those powers. But, you know, two guys are dead by his hand. In Fundamonium, three people get hit with a, and I quote, flaming licorice bazooka. In Stranded, Carl Sheen and Libby launch a torpedo at a cruise ship. I'm pretty sure they killed Dr. Moist in The Evil Beneath, as well as his three algae men, who are confirmed to be humans Dr. Moist transformed. In the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour 3, Jimmy and Timmy kick their villain all around town, destroying someone's house. And in League of Villains, Hugh sends the town back in time to the Jurassic era. Also, Jimmy abandons the League of Villains in the Jurassic era, presumably to die. But if Jimmy could escape that once, I assume Calamitous or Baby Eddie could too, so these characters probably live. Then again, Jimmy Neutron characters seem to have the constitution of Looney Tunes, so maybe some of these people are fine. Jimmy saves Zix and Barbarino, I am not calling him Travoltron, so they get rid of the dinosaur for him. And Jimmy hatches a plan to defeat the League of Villains while Cindy reverses the wormhole. I'd like to see Betty Quinlan do that! No, I'm with you. They trap the villains in the past, Jimmy and Cindy hold hands, and the series ends on a naked baby. And that's the finale of the adventures of Jimmy Neutron, Boy Genius. Except, I may have told you guys a little fib. This was certainly written to be the finale of Jimmy Neutron, but uh, Nickelodeon had a policy at the time of not allowing shows to have big final episodes because they wanted kids to keep watching reruns in the hopes that their favorite shows would come back. The actual final episode was that one about Sheen's dad and the dog show. And I could complain about this frankly manipulative tactic that ruins what could be a great finale for Jimmy Neutron. 
it's not perfect, but Jimmy Neutron's not perfect. This is exactly the finale the show deserves. But that's not even the worst part of this episode. When do you think they released this? Was it late in the series so it could at least stand as, like, the last big event of the series? Or, you know, at least after all of these characters had been introduced? No, in fact, this episode came out right before the one where Carl... Well, you know. Yes, this episode came out before Baby Eddie had been introduced, before Grandma Taters had been introduced. It uses clips from Incredible Shrinking Town, which hadn't been released. Nickelodeon didn't watch their own show and expected kids not to notice. But I noticed! I kept up with this show, and when these characters showed up with no explanation, I was very confused. And then when the episodes came out that they were in, I was very upset, because Nickelodeon was releasing episodes in the wrong order. AGAIN! When it was just the Libby's hair thing, whatever, that's an aesthetic thing. But now they're ruining the story! It also made me suspicious. Maybe Vanishing Act makes sense if I'd seen the episode that was supposed to come before it. So, obviously I made this whole thing as a bit of a trip down memory lane, but... I also did it to finally get the whole picture. This was a show I was obsessed with at one point, and by the ending, I had completely lost the plot. So, now that I have the tools at my disposal to step back and look at Jimmy Neutron as a whole, I can finally take it all in. So what do I think of Jimmy Neutron's final season? I had reservations going in, but honestly, this is still as good as the show's ever been. There's weird tonal stuff at the very end, but this season still has series highlights. The show doesn't totally wrap up, but it's a pretty episodic series. Jimmy defeats all his greatest villains, and Jimmy and Cindy are more or less confirmed. Honestly, what more could you want? In my life since Jimmy Neutron, I've discovered I often like content that really isn't for everyone. But that fact, the realization that something isn't for everyone, kinda makes me like it more. It's like something made specifically for me. The Adventures of Jimmy Neutron Boy Genius is not gonna be for everyone. It's far from a perfect show, in fact it can be an outright bad one sometimes. But it's my show. It's a show that entertains me. Because for every one low point of the series, I could think of half a dozen highs. It's a show that's good far more often than it's bad. And occasionally, in very rare moments, it's genius. But I can't act like the bad isn't there. I can't act like I don't understand why people don't like it. But I hope, if you can get past its rough exterior, you can enjoy what really works about the show, because a lot does. The comedy is hilarious, the stories can get really weird, really fun, and really creative, and I just love the characters. This is a show with great characters. Sure, you got your Betty Quinlins and your quirky Shimatsus, but that's not what kept people invested. I'm talking about guys like Nick and Miss Fowl, Judy and Goddard, kooky villains like Calamitous and Ublar. You get Libby, Carl, Sheen. You get Hugh. And of course, you get Jimmy and Cindy. Jimmy and Cindy make this show. And look, I know it's called Jimmy Neutron. It makes sense to say about him, but I don't think this show works without Cindy. It is their show. And I get it, Enemies to Lovers is a sitcom trope as old as time, but Jimmy Neutron almost doesn't even pretend. Jimmy and Cindy are combative because they like each other. That is the whole point. You come back every week to see if this is going to be the episode they figure that out. And you have a lot of fun along the way. There's certainly other good stuff in this series, but that is the show's overarching plot. Two kids who don't know how to process liking each other. And damn if I don't love them each individually too. They're both smart, funny characters. I said early on I really related to Jimmy, but I also really related to Cindy, at least partially because she always seemed to see how Jimmy's plans were going to fail before he did. But if time has proven anything, it's that I'm not Jimmy or Cindy, I'm Sheen. So allow me to get really geeky about a show I love and correct something no one cares about. 
this video from Nickelodeon Rewind, an officially licensed Nickelodeon page, of all the firsts and lasts of the series. They say Jimmy and Cindy's first crush moment is in Episode 7 Trading Faces, but... Prior to that, in episode 2, Normal Boy, a brain-drained Jimmy tells Cindy she's cute. Plus, in episode 3, Brobot tells Cindy he thinks Jimmy likes her. Then they say the final crush moment is her swooning over him in My Big Fat Spy Wedding, which isn't even close to right as that was before Crouching Tiger Hidden Sheen, Vanishing Act, Lady Sing the News, and King of Mars, all of which featured Jimmy and Cindy's relationship as major plot points. Nick, it's been 20 years, and you still haven't watched your own show! The disrespect for this show, man. Can Jimmy Neutron take any more indignities? Sheen. Do not push this button. Following the end of Jimmy Neutron, showrunners Keith Alcorn and Steve Oderkirk pitched Nickelodeon a show titled Red Acres, about a fast food employee who gets trapped on an alien planet. Nick turned it down on the grounds they didn't want a show about someone older than their target demographic, even though their most successful show of all time is about a fast food employee. Anyways, they retooled the show into a Jimmy Neutron spinoff titled Planet Sheen, about everyone's favorite fanboy getting stuck on the planet of Xenu. Uh, spelled with a Z, this isn't a Scientology thing. So, I'm not gonna go in depth with Planet Sheen for two reasons. For one thing, I struggled to talk about even the episodes I did watch. There's just nothing to say about this show. And two, this whole thing was supposed to reflect my experience with the Jimmy Neutron franchise, and checking out a couple episodes of Planet Sheen before just ignoring it is very much my experience with the Jimmy Neutron franchise. Planet Sheen was pretty much doomed from the start. Of course, this wasn't initially meant to tie into Jimmy, which would probably explain how disconnected it feels from the series. And it also has the same problem a lot of spinoffs have. Sheen is not a leading man, he's a comedy relief character. I'm not saying you can't do a Sheen show, but I am saying you can't do a Sheen show without Libby. I reiterate, Sheen and Libby were not a will they won't they, they were. To not even mention her in this is such a slap in the face to Sheen's character. But I think most damningly is this. Jimmy Neutron ended in 2006, when I was 11. Planet Sheen started in 2010, when I was 15. Now, as a Jimmy Neutron superfan, I was curious enough to check out Planet Sheen when it debuted. But I gave up pretty quick, and it seems like I'm not alone as the series ended after only one season. Sheen is technically the only character from the main series to return, but Carl has been resurrected as a slug alien named Doppy, who's basically the same character. Along with them, you get Nesmith, a space monkey, Haha, <laughs> like Michael Nesmith from the Monkees. Asifa, who's an Avatar reference, which really highlights how far CG had come since that Johnny Quasar clip. Dorcas, the Squidward-esque villain who's constantly getting hurt by Sheen. And Emperor Brick. The 23rd. In the pilot, Sheen accidentally steals Jimmy's rocket and ends up on Xenu, where their version of the Bible mentions Sheen arriving in a spaceship to bring peace. So that's two religions where Sheen is the chosen one. But Dorcas wants to execute him for destroying his home. Hey, that's it. This is all a dream. I'm gonna wake up and the sun will be shining. I'll be back on the farm. Yeah, actually, this is uh, a Back at the Barnyard spinoff, actually. Uh, nothing to do with Jimmy Neutron. Sheen, no! Damn, that was a short series. Moving on. Nah, okay. Sheen meets the Emperor's daughter, Umlaut, which is the name of those dots you see over European words. She is voiced by Candy Milo and Debbie Derryberry, the voices of Nick and Jimmy, so it's nice they came back. Sheen goes deep into the forest and meets Nesmith, and instead of the cool Adam transitions, they do this. Do what, monkey, monkey, boing? which is obnoxious. They're attacked by a dragon, but Avitar shows up to save them. 
And man, Sheen's dad couldn't have shit. Sheen only writes to his grandmother at the end of episodes. No mention of his dad at all. And then Doppy makes a last second appearance that's honestly the funniest part of the episode. Immediately the visual style strikes me. I appreciate the colors, Jimmy was always a tad washed out for my taste. But while the models and textures are better than they were eight years ago, I'm not super into the design. It's not bad, but it's indicative of a deeper problem. This feels like it's for an even younger demographic. It's got so much less edge than Jimmy Neutron ever did. That really doesn't make sense to me. Kids young enough to enjoy this at the time didn't grow up with Jimmy Neutron. Maybe they caught some reruns, but I'm pretty sure even those had mostly dried up by 2010. We didn't get to hear it in the pilot, but the theme song lets us in on the kind of show this is. Oh, my cheese, cows, not monkeys, planet, sheen is oh so funky. Okay, I get the last part, but the first two lines, we just off, bro. Random nonsense followed by snarky remark about random nonsense. The second episode sees Sheen face off against a unicorn in a joke that feels like a rehash of the last episodes about big flowers. I didn't laugh at anything in this episode, but I was never really annoyed either. It was just kind of there, and that's kind of how the whole show was, and it's probably why I stopped watching as quickly as I did. The B segment gives me a little more to work with. There's a Donald Trump joke? Even real estate impresario Tronald Dump. <gasps> the man who built Dump Towers? You're discharged. 2010 was the weirdest time to make a Trump joke. He had mostly fallen out of the public light at that point and hadn't made his political career comeback yet. Chips and dip! Genius! We always thought it was dips and chip. One chip! That's all it was. It was just a big mess on a chip. W was that a joke? I did check out the one and only episode of this that's ever even slightly interested me, Cutting the Ultra Cord, where Sheen finally addresses his Ultra Lord obsession. It's weird that Jim Cummings as Ultra Lord is the only returning cameo in this series, so I want to see what's going on here. <laughs> this was a mistake! It's weird that they try to play Avatar Girl as a love interest. Sheen has a girlfriend he is trying to get home to. I have my doubts this will work long term. Ultimately, Sheen finds he misses Ultra Lord. But Sheen, this much of an overreaction is just a bad response to missing a show. You should express it in healthy ways, like making five hours of content about it. Of course, he has this revelation while fighting an angry monster, which he beats in a dance-off. Ooh, their wife must have stepped on her husband. Well, that's actually par for the course for Jimmy Neutron. And deciding he basically does the same thing Ultra Lord does, he doesn't miss Ultra Lord anymore. That's, uh, that's a stretch. Wasn't he also saving the world all the time in Jimmy Neutron? Although I found myself weirdly entertained by the Beast segment where Sheen talks the king into holding a trial when it looks like Nesmith ate his pet bird. It's still Planet Sheen, but I think it plays to the show's few strengths. It's fun to see people accept every strange word that comes out of Sheen's mouth. And then I watched the last episode to air. The final episode of anything Jimmy Neutron, and wow, the animation looks worse by the end. It's so flat, there's no detail. And they seem to have accepted how formulaic the show is. That doesn't make it good, but it's not offensive or annoying, it's just kind of nothing. The B segment is about bugs that wedgie people. That's it. That's the note the series goes out on. And unlike Jimmy, there's not some ignored alternate finale. The final episode of Planet Sheen is just another episode because every episode is just another episode. I've heard they wanted to end Planet Sheen with a big TV movie where Jimmy and the gang come to rescue him, but couldn't because the show failed in nearly every regard. But if it was gonna be in the tone of Planet Sheen, maybe it's best that never existed. I have a hard time getting angry at Planet Sheen because it's just so disconnected from Jimmy Neutron. I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. I wanted more Jimmy Neutron and that's not what this is. And what it is, a juvenile show seemingly aimed at a younger age group than Jimmy Neutron, doesn't really do anything for me. But is that even a good thing? It's weird, so much nostalgia bait garbage gets torn apart online, but the biggest complaint about Planet Sheen is just that it exists, because 
There's nothing else to say about this show. It shouldn't exist. You couldn't even let Jimmy have the final word on his own franchise. Instead, it's two episodes that both involve underwear. Though, that would bring us full circle, I guess. Right back to Win Pants Attack. There hasn't been much Jimmy Neutron media since Planet Sheen. Jimmy Neutron's final appearance was in a Chrysler commercial of all things. That's such an odd final appearance. But I doubt we've seen the last of the boy genius. The whole gang got together recently for a 20th anniversary reunion. Everyone involved certainly seems to want a revival. Hype for the show has never been higher. It would be silly of Nickelodeon to never touch the franchise again. Sure, either way you slice it, Jimmy Neutron didn't exactly end well, but that's why I have saved the best for last. There's always a silver lining. Sure, Jimmy Neutron could have gone on, but for how much longer? After all, there are those Nick shows that have discovered a fate worse than death. Who's the super cool cop? It always gets the bad guy. That's me, yeah. He brings a delicious assortment of sweet delights. Donut boy! Got a creamy filling. 